Well, I have another good letter to read to you this morning. Are you glad about that? John, I want you to come over here and stand with us right now, would you? Why don't you give your pastor a hand clap? Enough. Let's do it one more time. Come on. You know, Jody, I want the people uh, uh, in the television audience to know a little bit about our spirit here. That's the reason I did that. But I thank you for that. Jody, you got a letter? Yeah, I do. Uh, this is good. You know how he said over and over that people perish for lack of knowledge. And that's the reason he teaches the Word of God to help us and to help you who are watching by television to know what God says about certain subjects so that when you need something from God, you'll know that it's yes. written right here in the book. Well, we got this letter, John. It's from way off. It's another state, and I have to be careful not to tell exactly which state because everybody will put it together. This is from a man, a professional man, a very intelligent man, and somehow or the other, he got one, my book on uh, healed of cancer. This man said, my wife and I came from generations of godly people, so when I was diagnosed as having terminal cancer of the colon, which had already metastasized to the liver, we're not, we were not surprised to experience God's great peace and comfort in the face of certain death. But after a week of abiding in this sustaining grace, a messenger of the Lord came to suggest that I was being destroyed from lack of knowledge. He then ministered healing and helped start me on this exciting journey of faith. I determined to saturate every part of my being with the scriptures, and soon the old book I had read since childhood became a living, Amen. flaming source of everything. Amen. Through the year that has followed, the blessed Word of God has transformed me by the renewing of my mind so that I am no longer conformed to the patterns of this world, particularly to those of the clinic, and it's a big, well-known clinic, where he went. By looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, I one day became aware that I was convinced and persuaded that the prayer offered in faith had made the sick person well. The Lord would raise me up. Well, anyway, then he goes on to say the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has been so creatively teaching and instructing me in the way that I should go. The enemy sends symptoms in the name of Jesus. They are rebuked. His divine power has given me everything I need for life and godliness. The strength of the Lord has enabled him to go ahead and work. And, but anyway, he just wants to tell us the transformation since he really read the Word of God and what it yes. says on healing. So that's what it would do to you if you listen Let's as he rejoice. preaches. Well, this is just a small part of what happens uh, through books and literature, and you can get a catalog if you want to write for it, and we'll help you any way we can. But we're going to teach you the Word of God today. So we're teaching a series on the book of Ephesians. So all you folks, get your Bible. Let's hold them up and make the devil mad. Everybody say it out loud. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same. I will never be the same. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Verse uh, 15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in our Lord Jesus and love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, there are two Holy Ghost-given prayers in the book of Ephesians. We have learned in this church to pray those over and over and over again. But I want to teach again to you here and also to the television audience I want you to understand that there are scriptural prayers to pray that will change your life, literally change your life. These are Holy Ghost-given prayers, and I can just read one of them to you today and touch on one of the simplest requests that is in the beginning of this prayer. Let's look at it. And this I pray, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he would grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him 
that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Could I have an amen? amen. You know God wants you to know his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to understand the greatness of Jesus, the wisdom that he has in Jesus. Our message is the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is that mystic secret of God. Do you know I preached 19 years as a Baptist preacher? And I'm not throwing off on the Baptist. Thank God for the Baptist. I thank God that I got much from the Baptist seminary. I thank God for Baptist ministers today who are doing a great work. But you know, I was limited in a certain way because I didn't know what I know now. And you know I preached for 19 years, and I didn't know much about Jesus. I didn't have a revelation of Jesus. I knew he died for my sins. I knew he came into my heart. I knew he saved me, and I knew he, I was going to heaven to be with him. That's about all I knew. But thank God we can pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it'll change the course of our life. I said it'll change the course of our life. The living, the Amplified Bible says... Pray that you, that you may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, insight into mysteries and secrets. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, it says in him, in Jesus Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. No wonder the apostle Paul said, even after many years of, of ministry, there in the book of Philippians, he writes from that jail in Rome when he says, oh, that I might know him. You see, you, we don't know all about him yet. Oh, that you might know him in healing power. That you might know him in his miracle power. That you might know him in his wonder-working power. That you might know him in the wisdom for the, for the storms of life. That you might know him in all of his knowledge and all of his mysteries. Oh, to have a deep insight into the Son of the living God. It's wonderful to know him because to know him is to know God. To know him is to know what God is like. To know him is to know the love of God and the mercy of God. That's why he said you ought to pray that the Spirit of God will unveil the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we pray that way, I got to pray in that way one day, and I found out he unveiled a Jesus to me. He was not a Methodist Jesus. He was not a Baptist Jesus. He was not a charismatic Jesus. He was not a Pentecostal Jesus. He was not a, a denominationalized Jesus. The Spirit of God unveiled a Jesus that was the Son of the living God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Well, shout amen. Yeah. And we need in this darkened hour to know Him, to know Him, to know Him. Let me ask you some questions. Who is Jesus? Who is He? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why was he raised from the dead? What can he do for me now that he's alive? Who is this Jesus? What does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, I want to say right away, the Bible clearly states that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jews. Doubt. The stars make their stately march across the heavens and the moon gives their barred light. But don't ever doubt that God has fulfilled his promise to the Jewish people and Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of the Jews. We've got to realize the Jewishness of the church. It was Jesus who was born as Isaiah said he would be born. Born of a virgin and brought into the world and called Emmanuel, God with us. For unto us a son, child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Can you imagine Isaiah, that great Jewish prophet said, there's going to be one born of a virgin that shall be called on the earth, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. He is the Messiah of the Jews. But Jesus is more than the Messiah of the Jews. He's the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world. 
Shout amen. amen. And you know, he's always been in existence. When you get a revelation of Jesus, you all think that he began in Bethlehem's manger. He didn't begin as a baby. No, he was long, long before that. Oh, he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did you know he was there when God called himself Elohim? He didn't call himself El, which means the mighty one. He called himself, and it's the first name in the Jewish Bible for God. It's Elohim, which means God in a plural unity, more than one. Who is that Elohim? He's Father, he's Son, and he's Holy Ghost. Thank God. He was there when the Father said, let us make man. Who was that us? That was the Holy Ghost. And there the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who existed before the morning stars sang together. He was there. And God looked at Jesus and looked at the Holy Ghost and said, let us make man. Jesus was there when God looked down at the Tower of Babel and said, let us go down. Let us go down. Jesus is the one that Job was talking about when he described the mighty God, when he described this powerful, almighty God of the universe. And then Job says, what is his name and what is his son's name? I want you to know that he is the Elohim. He was there in the beginning. He was there in Bethlehem manger to become a man to feel the pain and the sorrow and the trouble that you and I feel. He was there to become a man. God became human flesh. He's called the Son of Man. He was there when he went down into the watery grave at baptism and the Holy Ghost came on him like a dove. He was there in his earthly life when he went out among suffering, sighing, crying, dying humanity and healed the sick cast out devils, made the, uh, the devil leave their lives, and lifted broken, sighing humanity. He is a revelation of God in the midst of suffering people. He was the one who went to the cross. Nobody took his life. Everybody, uh, no one could say, we killed Jesus. No, he laid down his life. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down to myself and I take it back. This is the commandment that I have received of my Father. So he is the one that laid himself down on that cross. He is the one that was lifted up between heaven and earth. Jesus, the Son of the God, the same one that was there before the world was made. The same one that was there when no man was made. The same one that was there in eternity of eternities. Now he's a man. He's God manifest in the flesh. What a terrible tragedy had struck this human race to bring God out of heaven. What brought him out? It was our sin. It was our rebellion. It was the rule of the devil over the human race. It was sickness and cancer and drugs and alcohol and divorce and all the other battles and storms of life. It was so serious for the human race that God came himself in the person of his son and now he's dying upon that cross. He is taking our sins. He is taking our sicknesses. He is tasting our death. He is taking our curse. Is it any wonder now the lovely Son of God, the bright and morning star, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the brightest of all heaven, the Father's love is now stretched out there with our cursing, our adultery, our fornication, our rebellion upon him. Now he hangs there. Is it any wonder the sun refused to shine and the world became dark in that hour? Is it any wonder the earth began to shake with a violent earthquake? They were revolting against the thought of holding the Son of God. But thank God he died. He died and he gave himself. He was buried. He went to hell. He's the same one that came out of the grave. Hallelujah. Oh, I said he came out of the grave. I said he came out of the grave. He's alive. The Son of the living God. He is alive. He's the one that went back to heaven. He ascended up to heaven as they watched him go. Oh, my. He went back through the hosts of hell, all of those demon powers around this earth. He ascended back beyond the clouds, beyond the stars, went on into that planet called heaven where God was. Opa, the gates opened unto him. Open up, the, the psalmist David said, open up the everlasting doors. Let the king of glory come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. He's coming home. He's coming home. He's mighty in battle. He's 
defeated the devil. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated sickness. He defeated the curse. And now open up your doors, O ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Jesus Christ, who is mighty in battle. Well, go ahead and shout. A, a revelation of Jesus. He's now seated at the right hand of God. Stephen saw him standing at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. He is ever living to make intercession for us who belong to him. And the Bible said because he's at the right hand of God, he is able, now listen to it, he is able to save unto the uttermost them that come unto God by him. When he stood after, after he came out of that grave and just before he went back to heaven, he stood before his disciples, all of them Jewish. Listen to me, Jewish people. God loves you. We love you. Your Messiah has come. You can believe. Ask God. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I'll tell you, Jesus has all power. He is the first human being who was put in a grave with a human body who came out of that grave with a glorified human body that was beyond the touch of death that would never die. He's the only human body in heaven now. And the Bible says that when he came back to appear in that human body, he said, touch me, flesh and bone. Uh, spirit hath not flesh and bone. He didn't say blood, but he's got flesh and bone. And yet he walked right through the wall. And he ate fish and honeycomb and walked out fish and honeycomb and all. I mean, he walked through that. There, no, nothing could stop him. He had a human body that was glorified. The Bible says, for one day we shall be like him. I said, we shall be like him. I said, we shall be like him. Let me tell you something, folks. This life is not all. Many of you are bitter and hard because of things that have happened in your life or to your family. And you say, it's not fair. It's not fair that this happened. It's not fair that this happened. It's not fair. I, mean, I agree with you. It's not fair. If this life was all, it would be a cruel existence because there are so many inequities and so many things that are so uh, have such an abhorrence in our sight. Sure, that's true if this life is all. But folks, this is just a place to get ready for eternity. Uh, we got all eternity, the ages of the ages, where there'll be no dying, no sighing, no crying, no death, no sickness, no sorrow, none at all. We got all eternity to live. Uh, this life is just a dressing room to get ready for eternity. Take the big look. Take the long look. So you suffered sorrow. So you had heartache. Oh, I tell you, when you step in the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to live for him, and then death comes and you step into that eternal place up there, I'll tell you, all of this will fade into oblivion, and you'll see that it was worth it all because you knew Jesus Christ. Could you shout amen? amen. I want to read this to you from the, from the Amplified. Okay, in many revelations, separate revelations, each one that set forth a portion of the truth, in different ways God spoke to our fathers. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Now he says he spoke to us in his son. Then he says seven things about his son, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, by through whom he created the worlds. Number three, uh, he created the reaches of space and, uh, and the ages of time. And he made and produced and operated and arranged them in order. You think about that. You could take a telescope and you could look out uh, hundreds and, and, and thousands and millions of light years. A light year is, is how far you would go if you travel 186,000 miles a second. I'm telling you, that's moving. You get to Baytown real quick. <laughs> but you see... The Bible says that he created the reaches of space out there millions of, of miles away, millions of light years away. They're still part of the, uh, of the created universe. Well, he created everything, the reaches of space. And then uh, the Bible says he made them, he produced them, he operates and arranged them in order. You can set your clock by the movement of this universe and it'll be on time a thousand years from now. It's so orderly. Then the Bible said, 
He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being the outring of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint of the very image of God's nature. Listen to this. Here's his power. Upholding, maintaining, and, uh, and, and guiding and propelling the universe by his word of power. When he had by himself cleansed our sins and riddance of guilt, he sat down beside the glory of God, having obtained a name that is above every name. I'm talking about the mighty Messiah of the Jews, the mighty Savior of the Gentiles, the mighty Son of the living God, the mighty revelation of God to the world. Don't ignore him. Every time you date a check, you honor his, his death, burial, and resurrection because that dates from the time he lived. Oh, we want you to know him. We want you to stay with us during these days when we go on and teach in, in this fashion all the way through the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, folks, you will never be the same. Let me close on television by saying this. I'm going to preach a little bit more here, and you can get this on, on a tape later on, all of the message. But listen, I want you to know that Jesus is well able to meet your needs. Open your heart, cry out to him, and let him into your heart, and trust his power, and you will never be the same. I guess you can tell this is Lakewood Church. Now, I've preached here so frequently, I feel like I'm one of the pastors. This is Brother Shambach, and I'm inviting you to mark on your calendar and set this day aside, April the 15th. We're going to honor the pastor, John Osteen, 50 years of ministry. And we're going to have a great world conference, and we're going to celebrate just 50 years of ministry with John Osteen and Doty. You know, Oral Roberts is going to be here, T.L. Osborne and Kenneth Hagan, and you. You are the most important one, and I want you to make sure that you are here at Lakewood Church. I'm giving you a personal invitation to be with me Saturday night, April the 15th, to honor the pastor of this church, he and his dear wife, Doty. 50 years of service. I'll see you here. Thank you, Brother Shambach, and I sure hope you come to be with us that Saturday night, April the 15th. It's not just to honor me, it's to bring glory to God for a half a century of preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't be here, remember it's going to be live on television, and we'll be glad to have you to join us that way. Well, thank you so much for letting us come into your homes uh, for this uh, telecast today. We believe the Word of God has helped you.